Thank you. I was just going to talk about government nudging, which is probably what you'd expect from me. But the events of the last week have rewritten my talk for me. I'll explain why. The way that COVID was managed by this government and governments around the world revealed some truths about human nature. People can be made to conform and follow authority by weaponizing psychological tendencies and using methods such as fear, shame, and ego. Propaganda and nudging were deliberately used to exaggerate the sense of risk and danger. Society changed. We all changed. We saw the evocation of mass hysteria and conformity in real time. It was like watching a real-life Milgram or Ash experiment. I felt this like an existential shock, and I'm sure lots of you did as well. And there's been another shock this week. The terrorism in Israel and the frightening escalation of violence and protests have been devastating. But the reaction here on our own soil has been sickening. <laughs> Pro-Palestine and de facto pro-Hamas marches were unsurprising, but it's still cut to the quick to hear chants of death to Israel, death to Jews, and gas the Jews. I hate even saying those words. But the casual support of atrocities hasn't ended there. Student unions, professors, politicians, and the media expressed messages of sympathy and solidarity with Gaza before Israel had even retaliated, while bodies hadn't even been counted. To a number of esteemed professors in the UK and the West, this blood-soaked pogrom was a fine example of decolonization. People who normally obsess over hate speech would not condemn acts of hate. COVID showed us how easy it is to obtain the compliance of the masses. And this terrorism is a lesson in how humans cheer on pain, destruction, and genocide. This week, the mask has slipped, and we've seen the face of evil. Part one of my two-part talk. We're trapped in a kaleidoscope of the next current thing. You donned a mask when the authorities flip-flopped in 2020 and told you to. You took the knee for BLM, a Marxist organization that wants to defund the police and disrupt the Western nuclear family. You stayed in to save granny's lives, but you went to the streets to save black lives. You banged a frying pan at your front door every Thursday for weeks. Every year, you add a rainbow to your social media profile photo for Pride month or season. You have a planet emoji to demonstrate your obedience to cl the climate cause. And whether or not you still use an FBPE hashtag, you have a Ukraine flag draped on your social media bio and your house. Emojis and avatars spin around social media like a kaleidoscope. And talking of colors and kaleidoscopes, the FA lit its arch in rainbow colors for pride. It lit its arch in blue and yellow for Ukraine. Good. It lit its arch in red, white, and blue when terrorists attacked Paris. Good. But it will not light its arch in blue and white for Israel. Perhaps the FA has adopted so many current things, it is dizzy and it's lost its moral bearing. Perhaps it's just spineless. That unlit arch is a symbol of the dark times we find ourselves in now. You either think that mowing down kids at a music festival, kidnapping and killing the literal elderly survivors of the Holocaust, and beheading and burning babies and children is terrorism, or you do not, like our national broadcaster. As Chief Rabbi Sir Ephraim Mervis said this week, the failure to use the term terrorist 
is a failure to be accurate and impartial, and it is a sign that we're losing our moral compass. So why have so many people on the left, which is where I used to consider myself to be, lost their moral compass on this issue? It must partly be down to the pernicious influence of the theory of decolonization and identity politics, oppressor versus oppressed, as they see it. What do we do about rooting out these ideologies and reestablishing our traditions and values? And I'm sure that is one of the purposes at the heart of this conference and this party. Part two, we live in a nudgeocracy. The person who coined the term nudge, Cass Sunstein said, by knowing how people think, we can make it easier for them to choose what is best for them, their families and society. Isn't it great? that there are people who know what's best for you. Psychology used to be about diagnosing and fixing people, and now it's at least as much about predicting and manipulating people. Nudging is now embedded in governments. The nudges, the psychocrats, as I call them, they know what's best for you and how to guide you towards it without you even being aware. Nudging is used by the government and its influencers to change the will of the people from the top down, whereas in a democracy, the government should be enacting the will of the people from the bottom up. We think we live in a democracy, but the truth is the power has been inverted without us even noticing. Since the first Behavioural Insights team was founded in the UK in 2010, there are now 300 Behavioural Insights units working with governments around the world to understand, predict, and shape human behavior. The shaping part has really taken off. Policymakers are increasingly asking behavioral scientists to help with policy problems. And sometimes that problem is you. I've written extensively about nudge and fear being used during the COVID pandemic. And a more current example is climate change. Um, you can find in multiple government documents that if the UK is to meet net zero climate goals, we need to change how we travel, what we eat and buy, and how we use energy at home. It is our behaviour that must change, apparently. We're given laudable reasons for ULES and low traffic neighbourhood policies, um, such as air quality and road traffic accidents. But sometimes they say the quiet part out loud. In a House of Lords report, in our hands, behaviour change for climate environmental policies. These policies are positioned quite clearly as measures to, in quotes, dissuade private vehicle use. This is all about making driving inconvenient and costly. It's a process of radical incrementalism. If they told you where they want to be, what the end goal is, you'd say no. So they do it step by step by step. So it starts with congestion charge, then les, then you les, then expanding you les, then pay per mile, etc. There are many examples of this, and it is behavioural science. There are obvious ethical issues with governments using nudge. Nudging undermines free will. Because nudging works, because you're not really aware of the choice they put in front of you. It's designed to be subliminal and, below, and work below the level of consciousness. I'd say it's quite obvious that changing people's behaviour without their knowledge and consent on behalf of a government is controversial and it shouldn't be a, modern, a pillar of modern government. Nudging is anti-democratic. Nudging also damages trust. Think about those behavioural scientists who decided that people's sense of risk and danger had to be exaggerated to make them follow the lockdown rules. And that went hand in hand with censorship of opinion, debate, and even facts in the media and online. Journalists and scientists were found guilty of wrong think, even on a website run by an MP. The overstating of vaccine benefits, the incentives and coercions to take the vaccine, including threatening bodily autonomy, will damage trust in public health authorities and governments for a long time to come. Trust is a reservoir that is filled very slowly, but it drains fast. 
Trust in government, media and institutions is generally at an all-time low in lots of countries. I put some of the blame for this squarely in the hands of the nudges, the censors and the propagandists. Jeremy Farrar, who's ex-Welcome um, Trust and a SAGE member, recently talked about the need to rebuild trust between the public and public health authorities when he joined the World Health Organization. It's very simple, Jeremy. Tell the truth consistently, long term. Be straight with people. Nudging is not straight. If we continue to allow ourselves to be nudged towards a greater good that's been defined by other people without our consent and knowledge, we've given up defining what good is. It might seem like I've talked about two different things, but the next current thing and a nudgeocracy are connected. We wouldn't be easily nudged and manipulated if we were not suffering from emptiness. And I think we all feel this emptiness in society and a sense of something being very wrong. When people are unanchored and empty, they're more likely to fall for the next current thing. They're more likely to mistake a pogrom for decolonization. We must do three things. First, tackle the insidious nudging propaganda and censorship by government. The public should be consulted on the use of behavioural science. As the founders of the Nudge Unit wrote themselves in their seminal document, Mindspace, nudging changes our relationship with government and it changes us. We've never been asked for consent. Nudging should operate within a formally defined ethical framework. It doesn't. And political parties should have to declare what they spend on behavioural science communications in manifestos, like they do for public health, defence, education. We should know what our money is being spent on. It is, after all, our brains they're sticking their fingers into. And government should be accountable. Second, determined to be sovereign of your own mind. If society is a plain and free fall, the first thing you do is put on your oxygen mask. Accept your brain as a battlefield. It's disputed territory, and governments, businesses, social media platforms, more, all want to get in and have a piece of it. You can get immunity. You can learn the nudges and the tactics. Once you've seen how the magic trick works, you'll never unsee it. You can protect yourself psychologically by adopting strong principles. Stand your ground. Trust your gut. Turn off your screens. Be the first to speak up. Stop haunting yourself with fears and stand for something or you will fall for anything. Third, finally, we must rediscover our traditions and values. We need to address the emptiness. A lot of us feel that something is wrong. A net is tightening on truth. Institutions are captured by bizarre ideology. There is a kaleidoscope of the next current thing. And this week, a shocking unmasking of barbarism. Eric Hoffer, Carl Jung, Eric Fromm, and many other great thinkers from the post-World War II period concluded that empty people are at biggest risk from totalitarian brainwashing. And that's why the next current thing, or any mass movement, is so easily interchangeable. It's not the ideology, but the need to believe and belong that appeals to people. We need to fill the emptiness with true meaning. We need to rediscover what we stand for individually and as a nation. Thank you.